Welcome to our Bible study. This is Lesson 20 of the Bible Prophecy and the Book of Revelation by Dr. Bill Waddell. Revelation 13 is where we are, and we're going to be not covering many verses tonight. Actually, we're only going to be in verse 18, more or less, uh, just dealing with the with the implications of it, at least. So, Revelation 13, though. So, like I said, we're not going to be making great progress necessarily in the scriptures, just covering a lot of scripture. We're basically going to be in verse 18, which talks about uh, the mark of the beast. And we're going to be getting that into just a bit. But I wanted to add uh, at this point, and basically an, an addendum to our study, uh, because there's not really a place to talk about it. It's sort of the only place to talk about it, because it kind of dovetails into what we're considering here. Uh, Help us, I believe, it'll help us understand current events and also as well, uh, possibly the end times. So I told you this morning we're going to be talking about the Muslim world, Muslim viewpoint, Muslim theology. There's a lot that we don't understand about them. And I would say that's a mistake. Uh, Because, well, because they're they're becoming the world dominant religion. Uh, So it's a mistake in that. It's also a mistake because you, you have to understand where they're coming from and why they do what they do. Uh, this is, again, Muslims, not necessarily Arabs. Muslims are not necessarily Arabs. It was started in the, Mus- in the Arab world. But the largest population of Muslims is actually not Arab. They're, uh, South, they're, they're South Asian. Uh, Malaysia, that area, the, the, the Philippines, the, those are largely Muslim areas. A lot more people, Muslims, live there than they do in the Middle East. The Middle East is basically deserted. I don't know the last time you were there. It's basically a desert, the whole thing. So... Um, so anyway, just, just some side information here. You probably heard the rumor that, uh, and pro- probably correctly so, that Muslims believe in Jesus. They actually do. But it's not your Jesus. It's a totally different Jesus. And I want to talk to you about that tonight. This is from their own, by the way, these, I'm pulling these off of their own websites and stuff. This is just, just to give them credit. I didn't make this stuff up. So that, here we go. Who's the, who's the Mahdi? We're going to be talking about that. And uh, what's his mission with Jesus? So Jesus is a very important character in uh, Muslim theology. The Muslims believe that Allah is God, uh, but that Allah is neither the God of the Jews nor is he the God of the Christians. He's not the God of the Bible at all. He's not Trinity. He is single. Uh, There is one God, Allah, and Muhammad is his prophet. This is their constant thing that they say. Uh, he demands submission and surrender, Allah does, according to them. That's where the word Islam comes from. It is the Arabic, it's Arabic for submit, Islam. So that's why you call their Islamics or their Mo- Muslims, and we have several different names that we have for them. Islam is actually their, their basic teaching, this, this submission. They have many similarities to Judaism and Christianity, including, very interestingly enough, a detailed eschatology. Do you know what eschatology is? Eschatology literally means the study of the end times. That's what we're doing together. We're, we're having an eschatological class. They have an eschatology. They have a teaching of the end. Very few religions do. Uh, Hinduism has, there's no end to Hinduism. It's just this constant circle. Uh, Christianity has, we've been talking about it, a very, very definite end. Judaism has a very definite end. Uh, uh, Muslims, the Muslim world, the Islamics, uh, have a very definite end. They have a theology of the end times. They only have two holy writings. One is the Quran, which supposedly was given to Muhammad by an angel. It's the words of Allah, but it was brought to him by an angel. This is Muhammad, and he wrote all these things down, and that's what we know. That's officially their Bible, more or less. The second holy writing is, is effectively Muhammad's commentaries on the Quran. It's called the Sunnah, and it's, or it's called the Hadith, H-A-D-I-T-H, the Hadith. You'll hear him say both of those things, which, which, like I said, are Muhammad's commentaries on the Quran. These together represent the body of their doctrines. They have these two uh, holy, holy scriptures, if you will. Their eschatology, they have three great signs, and each one of these signs is represented by a person. So, each one of these signs is a person. The first one that I want to talk to you about is this, this Mahdi. Here's his, this is his representation. You notice he's standing in front of these the countless hordes of Muslim ar- army, and this is this, this, this savior that they expect is coming. I want to talk to you first about him. The number one person is this Mahdi. He's also called the 12th Imam. 
You've probably heard them say that, which means the enlightened one or the purified one. He's represented in their literature this, like this, this, this guy in this robe, traditional Middle Eastern garb. He's surrounded by uh, the, that blue up there is doves. He's going to bring peace to the earth. They believe that. Uh, he's got this, he's often pictured with this green sort of uh, halo around his head. Here he is approaching the planet. He's going to be the world, one world leader, they believe converting the whole world to Islam. And uh, everyone is going to be Muslim after the Mahdi comes. M-A-H-D-I, Mahdi, is, is what he's called. Uh, he, is, uh, he will first come and make peace accord. Here's their own teaching. So listen to this carefully. He will first, they say, come and make peace with Israel and make a covenant with Israel for seven years. Sound familiar? That's not from our Bible. That's from their literature. Sounds very familiar, doesn't it? He will come, interestingly enough, he will come riding a white horse. Sound familiar? Chapter 6, the first, what's the first, uh, breaking the first seal, what comes out of it? This one riding a white horse, holding a bow. In this case, he's holding a sword. But this is their Mahdi. They, they trust him. Of course, this is not what we've taught about the guy riding the white horse. He's not a good guy at all. They believe that he is. Uh, he will come and make a peace corps with Israel for seven years. He will come on a white horse. Uh, Saddam Hussein, when our guys uh, invaded uh, Iraq and uh, took over Baghdad, Saddam Hussein had pictures of this, this, this type of imagery painted on many buildings, many murals of this Mahdi, this guy riding a white horse in this white robe. And this is their savior. He's coming, they say. He, he will, according to their thinking, their teaching, he will be loved by all peoples. He will come to bring peace and unity to the world by converting everyone to Islam. And that would bring peace, I guess. We wouldn't be killing each other like we are right now. Christians fighting Islam. Of course, I don't think that would fix anything. But uh, he will do it with the help of the second person. So the first person in this signs of the end times is this, is this Mahdi, the one come, coming riding a horse. The second person, the second person is Jesus, actually. He's the second most important person in all of their eschatological teachings. By the way, here's a picture of, and this is off their stuff, it asks the question, who's the Mahdi? And that's not a very good picture, by the way. It's, I, you know, I had to rip it off of, off of the internet, and so it doesn't come through very well. But you can see, uh, who's the Mahdi in this picture, by the way? You've got two people standing here. One's Jesus, one's the Mahdi. Do you know which one it is? Of course, you may pick out Jesus to be the guy on the road, but that's not who Jesus is. That's their Mahdi. Jesus is the guy with the sword. Jesus is a guy in the Muslim military garb with the shield. How could that be Jesus? Like I said, it's not your Jesus. It's their Jesus. Their Jesus is not at all like your Jesus. He returns to earth as a radical Muslim. Jesus does, in their opinion, the real Jesus. The Jesus that we're totally mistaken. We've been, we've been brainwashed by these 12 apostles who had, who had no information whatsoever, but they invented our religion. They taught us something different about the real, actual Jesus. The actual Jesus was always a Muslim. He was one of the prophets of, of Allah, that's according to their teachings. He is a warrior. He's radical, always carrying this flaming sword and this great shield you find represented in their, uh, in their literature. Uh, he's not the world's savior. He comes in submission to the world savior who is the Mahdi. He submits himself to the overlord who is their, their Mahdi, their savior, their, their everything, this enlightened one, this purified one, as he's called. According to their teachings and traditions, he will come back holding the wings of two angels who flew him down from heaven. He, arri he will arrive in a minaret in Damascus in Syria. Uh, he will acknowledge the Mahdi as Lord and he will make a pilgrimage to Mecca. This is the real Jesus as far as they're concerned. So use the same word, use the same name, but like I said, when you hear them talking about Jesus, understand, they're not talking about your Jesus. They're not talking about the biblical Jesus. Here's one of the things that their Jesus is going to do. It's crucial, by the way, that he returns. Uh, he returns at a crucial time to set Christians and Jews straight, and that's what he's going to do. He's going to tell all Christians that he never actually died, according to their teachings. This Jesus, when he comes back, he only ascended to heaven like, like Elijah did. He was never actually killed. There was no crucifixion, therefore no, no resurrection. 
God took him up because he was a prophet of God, took him up to be with him, and now he's standing with God in heaven. He's waiting for the end times when God sends his Mahdi, and then God will send him down on the wings of these two angels. He will land in Damascus. He will come and say to all the Christians and all the Jews, you were totally wrong. The whole Bible is totally wrong. Uh, and that's going to be, uh, that's what they teach about Jesus. He will tell the Christians that the gospel is wrong and the New Testament is wrong. He will correct all misinterpretations of himself. They say in their own literature, quote, he will shatter crosses. In other words, he will say, that cross is ridiculous. There was never a cross. I never died on it. Why do you have it around your neck? Why do you put it on top of your church? He will shatter, and if you will, crosses. He will shatter a whole idea of what the cross was, according to what their teachings are. He will promote the worship of the Mahdi and of Allah. That's his whole purpose. And he will be the prophet of the Mahdi. He will tell the Jews that they were wrong about their faith. In fact, they say, since he's Jesus, he's also Jewish, but he's a Muslim. So again, it, you know, it's not an ethnic issue, it's a, it's a religious issue. He is actually, he's Muslim, but he's not Arab. He's Jewish. Sound familiar to you? He will bring the Christians and the Jews to Islam and thus bring world peace. But for those who do not believe, he will lead a vast army and he will blot the world out, blot, blot them off the world, just destroy all of them. He's going to kill many, many people according to their teaching. His army will carry a black flag with one word written on it, the word in, in Arabic, Arabic of punishment. If you want to see that, by the way, you can see it. Pull up any, not any, but, but uh, pull up anything about Iran and Iranian military. You see they all fly on these black flags. When that word that's written in Arabic on there is the word punishment. They believe they're the precursors. They're the, they're the beginnings of the army of the Mahdi, but to be led by the underlord who is Jesus. Uh, they, this is, they believe this. They teach this. You find, for instance, uh, when you hear, especially when you hear uh, leaders in uh, Iran teaching, they will often say, glory to the Mahdi or the 12th Imam. Constantly they will say this. They will not start a speech until they say that because they're looking forward to this one who is coming, this, this true Christ, as they say, this true leader who's coming. Uh, he will conquer the world. Uh, the Mahdi will, and, and in particular Jesus will. He will conquer in particular Israel. He conquers Israel, and especially Jerusalem, because he intends to set up the Mahdi as the king in Jerusalem to prove that he is actually, that the real Jesus, that, or the Jesus that we've been taught is not the real Jesus. That the owner and the ruler of Jerusalem is actually not Jewish. He's this, this Mahdi, this 12th Imam who is coming. And so the final act of this Muslim Jesus is to kill their antichrist. You know who their antichrist is? According to them, he's the liar. He's called the Dajjal, D-A-J-J-A-L, the great deceiver, this Muslim antichrist. So we have three persons. We have the Mahdi, we have Jesus. These are the three great signs. And the third and final great sign is a single person. He's called the Dajjal. He actually, he's the fake, according to them. He's the fake Jesus. He's the Jesus that says he's the Jesus of the Bible. He's the Jesus that says he died and resurrected on a cross, died on a cross and resurrected. He's the Jesus that's going to be coming back to claim the world as his, but in fact, it doesn't belong to him. It belongs to the Mahdi. It belongs to the Muslim Jesus. And they're going to, of course, according to their teachings, they're going to defeat this fake Jesus, this, this false prophet. And the armies of the Muslims are going to destroy him, and they're going to establish Islam forever. Do you see what this is? See what their teachings are? The exact opposite of the New Testament in every way. In every way, the end times teachings of what we have, you flip it on its back and you have Islam. Islam is the exact counterfeit and reversal biblical antichrist, the false prophet, and of Jesus. The Mahdi riding on a white horse making a seven-year peace covenant with Israel. Who is he? He's the antichrist. He's the antichrist. The, the, the Jesus of, of their teachings, submitting to the Mahdi, promoting his worship, leading his armies, is the biblical false prophet. And of course, their antichrist is, is our Jesus. Isn't that weird? Isn't that wild? It's scary. It's, well, it's just, it's, it's interesting because, you know, you have false teachings all over. We have false, false prophets, false people, false people claiming to be Jesus and and for the, in a large part, they're sort of um, benign. 
Because it's just like, come on. I mean, you guys, you got 100 people following you and you're claiming to be it. I mean, I'm thinking it would have a big number after them. On the other hand, you got a very powerful teaching, monotheistic teaching, old, 500 years younger than, than New Testament Christianity, but really that's, that's all. That's when Muhammad supposedly received these messages from, from Allah through this angel. So, so it's very old, very pervasive. I mean, they, they conquered the large part of the world. Uh, they took over after, after the, when, when Rome fell, basically they took all of Northern Africa. They took all of Arabia, of course, uh, everything in the Middle East, all the way up to India, all of Turkey, half of, of uh, I guess you could say, the eastern part of, of Europe, they conquered. Uh, they were stopped. They, they conquered and, and ruled over, over Christendom, I guess you could say, over Spain for 500 years. You ever notice that you can take, no offense, that not trying to be prejudicial or, or, or uh, what's the word, um, racist in any way. You ever notice that you can take you can take the typical Mexican, put them, put, them on a, put them on a camel, put a turban on the head, you can't tell the difference. You want to know why? They have a lot of Arab blood in them. Because you live in a, in a, in a country for 500 years, you, there's some mixing going on there, of course. There's a lot of them. A lot of the last names that you see in Mexico and in, in Spain today, the last names that end in EZ, like Hernandez, Perez, these EZ names, e, I call them EZ names, those are Middle Eastern names. They're not Spanish. They're not. They come from Middle East. You have the name Perez is in the Old Testament. It's in the book of Genesis. It's a Middle Eastern name. So how did that, how did that name get over there? Well, the Muslims conquered Spain. They were there for 500 years. Muslims are a force to be reckoned with. It is so, so here's the question. Is this how it ends? That's what it is. We got it now. I mean, is it the Muslims? Is it going to be them? I don't really know. Seems to point that way. I mean, are, are we seeing the Antichrist regime rising in the Islamic world? One of the problems people have with this, and that I had initially when looking at this, one of the problems people have with this possibility of the Antichrist being a Muslim is that the Bible says he's a Roman. So they say, well, that can't be. We can just cross that off. Well, you realize the Muslims rule, they basically dominate, well, they dominate all of North Africa. They all dominate all the Middle East and all of Turkey. That's 60%, by the way, guys, of what Rome ruled. 60%. And of course, they're on the rise in Europe, are they not? I mean, there's this whole Muslim invasion happening over there. They're on the rise there. So, so it, when you think of Roman, don't think Italian necessarily. We immediately think, oh, it must be an Italian of some kind. You know, Rome, Rome was very, very few actual Romans were Italians. Paul, who was 100% Jew, he said, I was born a Roman. So it's not an ethnicity. It's, it's, a, it's like the United States. What does it mean to be American? But I, we were born here. What's your background? Oh, I'm Irish. I'm Jewish. I'm this. I'm that. I'm Mexican. I'm this. You know, you're Americans, right? Same is true with Romans. There was all kinds of Romans, if you will. They were Spanish. They were French. They were German. They were Italian. They were Greek. They were Middle Eastern. They were Jewish, as in the case of, in the case of Paul. So, so that we, I think, to get hung up on this whole issue of it can't be, he can't actually be the Antichrist because the Antichrist has to be a Roman. I just simply say, what is a Roman anyway? A Roman can be almost anything. So I don't think we can rule it out by just simply saying, oh, well, he's going to be a Roman, so we, we, can't, we can't trust in that. Like I said, the invasion, and also we're not going to take the time to look at it, but the invasion of the north from the north that is predicted in Ezekiel 38 and 39 called the Gog and Magog invasion. Take a, take a chance. Those are long chapters, but when you get home tonight, take some time and read those chapters because it names the countries where these invading armies are going to come from. 100% of them today are Muslim. 100%. It names Turkey, it names Iran, it names Sudan, it names uh, Libya, it names, I believe, Syria, it names uh, Armenia. These are Muslim countries, guys. These are not Christian countries. These are not atheistic countries. They're very committed religious people. So, so we'll leave it right there. I just wanted to present that to you. I'm not sure how familiar you, you were. I know I was not very familiar with Muslim theology, but I thought it would be very important for us uh, to consider that, just considering where we are in, in, in this day and time. I mean, look where we are as far as the Muslim world is concerned, what's happening in the Muslim world. It's very interesting. I find it um, just so weird to me 
that I've been here for 20 years, going on 20 years. And the, the first year I was here was when they flew the planes into the, to the towers and into uh, the Pentagon. Those were radical Muslims, right? And we were as bad as anti-Muslim as a nation could possibly be for a while. We were doing all kinds of, it's very interesting. We now have two, two uh, is it senators? No, two, two people that sit in the House, House of Representatives who are now Muslim. It's, I'm not against that necessarily. I'm just saying, isn't that weird though? How, how do we so quickly go from being, we got to conquer these people to now they're, they're governing us. I, I just find it's a question that I have. Uh, I, don't, I don't know what the answer is necessarily. So let's, let's get to our scriptures. We're ready to look at this, the whole issue of the number of the beast. And it's complicated. It's not easy. And I want to remind you that especially the last end of this chapter is written to those who are going to be living during this time. They're going to need to know who this guy is. They're going to be able to need, need to interpret him and why, what he's doing and what his name means. And so I don't have a name for you that's going to add up to the number 666, but I want to give you some things that I think is going to be very interesting. And so it causes, he says in verse 16, he causes all the small and the great and the rich and the poor and the free men and the slaves to be given a mark on their right hand and on their forehead. Remember we talked about it in the Old Testament in Zechariah 11 where this Antichrist is going to be injured in the head and in the hand. So it's like they're, 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 they're receiving on themselves these marks that mark them to belong to him. It's almost like a, a, a counterfeit baptism. Like why do we go under the water and raise? Because our Savior, our Christ was buried and raised on our behalf. So we're taking, if you will, his mark on us. It, it marks us. We do it publicly because it publicly marks us. Likewise, they're going to be doing sort of a counterfeit baptism here, this, this whole mark issue. So it's not just a matter of, well, I need to get some food, so I need to get a mark on my hand. No, it's, it's a matter of commitment. This is a very religious thing. It's a love relationship they're entering into with this guy, this, this antichrist. I want you to understand that. So, so he, he causes them to receive these marks, and he provides that no one should be able to buy or to sell except the one who has the mark. Either the, and here's the mark, it's either the name of the beast or the number of his name. Now, what is that? So if I asked you, what is the number of your name, would you even know what that is? Say, hey, Mark, what's the number of your name? You got no idea, right? You actually have a number. Did you know that? You're going to find out. There's, there's a way to know all of your numbers, by the way. It depends on what, what language you look into. It'll, be, it'll change depending on the language. But there's actually a, a number for your name. His, here is wisdom, verse 18. That's the Antichrist. Let him who understands calculate the number of the beast. It's interesting it says that, but then it gives us the number. So it's like find the answer, but here's the answer kind of thing. Why is it doing that? Because he wants you to know. For the number is that of a man. The, the number of man in the Bible is the number six. Number seven is the number of completeness. Man's not complete. He's one short of it all the time. He's six. Well, the number, of, the number is that of a man. Its number is 666, the big 666 number uh, that has become um, wildly popular, infamous, or whatever. This number is based on a thing called gematria, G-E-M-A-T-R-I-A. Gematria is what, in the old days, before Arabic numbers, a uh, lot of languages had what was called gematria. In other words, they had every letter had a number equivalent. So let me give you an example. So like in our language, if we, if we were a gametriac language, then our, our A would be equivalent to the number one, B would be equivalent to number two, C, you know, all the way. And they, what they would do is they would run the first 10 letters be equivalent to, to one through 10. The next 10 letters would be equivalent to 10 through 100. I mean, sorry, yeah, 10, 20, 30, 40, 60, 60, 70, 80, 100. The next 10, if they had a 10, any more beyond that, it'd be 100 to 1,000. So they would have these big increments so they could take them and put, put letters together, and the letters represented numbers. So Mark, M-A-R-K, has a number of value to it because M has a number of value, A has a number of one, R has a number of value, K has a number of value, so you would add up your name that way. These numbers were in ancient biblical scribes, in fact, and you find them most often, the, the Bible, for instance, has a number to it because they were prominent in both the Hebrew, the ancient Hebrew, and the Greek languages. They had what's called a gematric languages. Every letter in their alphabet, so, so you could literally go, and this is what some of the Old Testament 
writers would do as they translated from one old scroll to a newer scroll, what they would do is they would take a page, let's say the, the book of Jeremiah, chapter 31, uh, would, would take up one page on a scroll. So what they would do is they would add up the numbers, values of the letters on the original scroll. Let's say it came out to 50,000. Then they would add up the number values of the letters on the scroll that they had just transcribed. And if the numbers didn't add up, they would throw this one away. They'd write it again. So they, they, it literally would run by the numbers. So they were, why, why, why do we have such accurate text? Because that's the way they did it. They would read both of them side by side. I can't find any errors. Okay, let's add up the gematria now. Do the numbers add up? Oh, no, it's one off. Throw this one away. Write another one. That's how they kept, that's how they kept accurate translations. I mean, that's, uh, we talk about almost uh, as much as it could be foolproof. That is definitely foolproof. So remember, and we come to Revelation and we hear this whole issue of the number of the beast and the, the number of his name. And remember that Revelation is written in code. It's in, it tells you that out front. And that the code is explained somewhere else in the Bible. Therefore, we shouldn't go to Newsweek or Time Magazine or anywhere else to find out what the number of the beast is. We should be looking in the scriptures. So what should we look for? Where does 666, other than the book of Revelation, show up in your Bible? Well, actually you find that it shows up three other places. All three of them are in the Old Testament. Two places that show up refer to the same thing. They refer to the number of uh, the weight of gold that was brought into Solomon's kingdom. Solomon had this number brought in, brought in in two different places, both in 2 Kings and in 2 Chronicles. It says it was 660 pounds. You suppose that's just a random number. And, well, lo and behold, it got 666 pounds. Uh, uh, I'm sorry. Uh, talents, not, not pounds, is something, something to the effect of like 30 tons of gold in one year. That's just an unimaginable amount. Though 666 talents of gold that, that Solomon received in two different places, it tells us that. So, so was Solomon sort of a symbol of the Antichrist? Yeah, he was. He was. Who, who was the king that brought idolatry into Israel? Solomon was. As bad as Saul was, as, 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 as bad a mistake as David made his father, neither one of them worshiped idols. Solomon did. He's marked. He's marked. I'm not saying he's the Antichrist. I'm not saying he repre you know, represents outside of that. I'm not saying we're not going to see Solomon when you get to heaven or anything like that. I'm not saying that. I'm just saying the Bible marks him that way because it wants you to know what this guy who's going to be in the future is going to be like. So he's going to be this, this idolatrous king. You can promote idolatry, but his primary idolatry is going to be he wants you to worship him. He wants you to trust him, whoever he is. The other place we find it, so two different places in the Old Testament we find it, Solomon about these 666 talents. The other place we find it mentioned is in Ezra chapter 2, verse uh, 13. And this is just a brief, a brief statement here. So all these people coming back from Babylon, back to Israel, Ezra is counting noses. And it's interesting that under the name of Adonikam, there's 666 followers, his descendants came. So what significance is that? Well, the only thing we have, we don't want to think about Adonikam. We can just translate his name. His name means the king of the enemy. The king of the enemy. It was intended to be a great, you know, something like you'll conquer your enemies. It was some kind of name given by his parents, but it actually is informative about what our Antichrist that we're talking about here, who he's going to be. He's going to be the king of the enemy. So he, that's what he's going to be. Otherwise, we find 666 found in some sort of cluded ways. For instance, Nebuchadnezzar's statue in the book of Daniel. Of course, we know that this is a symbol of, of the Antichrist. You've got this worldwide, world-conquering king who makes a statue. Everybody has to worship it on pain of death, right? But the difference between, of course, Nebuchadnezzar and the Antichrist is they're both going to be world-dominating kings, but the Antichrist is going to be supernatural. He's going to be rising from the dead and doing these supernatural miracles and all this. But I find it interesting that if you go to the book of Daniel, especially in the older text, you'll find out that the exact measurements of the statue was 60 cubits tall, it was six cubits wide, and it was ministered to by six specific instruments. So you have a six, if you will, 666 involved in the statue, sort of a marker that just carries it on through the rest of our story. Another place you find that, like I said, in a way, is in the story of, of David and Goliath. G 
Goliath has 666 in some ways written on him. It tells us he, had, he was six cubits tall, he had six pieces of armor, and his spearhead weighed 600 shekels. So you have there again, 666. So what's this, this, this man that's coming, whoever he is, is going to be some sort of f- giant figure. I don't know about physically necessarily, but, but certainly a giant figure, a dominating figure, a, 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 a towering figure making this, this, uh, this powerful um, um, statue and to be worshipped. By the way, who killed Goliath? What was David? He had a title. No, oh, by the time by that time he had a title. Samuel took him off by himself and poured something on his head, and he says, "Now you are what? You're the anointed of God." You know what that word is in Hebrew? Messiah. You're the Messiah of God. They call all their kings Messiah because you anointed them. That was the word. So David was the Messiah of God. Who killed the Goliath? The Messiah of God did. Who's going to kill Goliath in the, Old Te- in the New Testament? In our end times? Messiah of God. We're looking for him. So this gematria is uh, primarily used in the Greek and Hebrew languages. It's very popular there. If you go into any Hebrew or any ancient Greek or Hebrew language textbooks, you'll see it, it, beside every letter is a number, and you can figure out what your name is, basically, and figure out what your number is if you want to. Uh, but, but the Antichrist, as we're told according to the Scriptures, is not going to be, he's not going to be Jewish or Hebrew. It says he's going to be, he's going to be particularly Roman. It says the Messiah will be cut off and have nothing. This is Daniel 9. And the people of the prince who is to come will destroy the city and the sanctuary. We know exactly who they were. So Jesus was killed in AD 33. He, he resurrected three days later. He walked with his disciples for 40 days. He ascended into heaven where he is today. And then 20 years later, I'm sorry, 40 years later, uh, here, um, 80, 66, so it's not exactly 40, a little bit less. Here comes the Romans. Five legions of Romans march against Israel and Jerusalem, and they destroy the whole place. We know exactly who they were. They were Romans. Like I said, every, that's, it's not a national, it's not a, an ethnicity, it's a nationality. So it can be that, but, but so, so we know that this guy is going to be a Roman. It's very interesting. The gematry you're most familiar with, you're familiar, you use gematry all the time. You do, you don't know that you do. But the gematry you're most familiar with is actually Roman gematry. Roman numerals, you notice they're not numbers, they're letters. Letter I is equivalent to what? One. Letter V is contributed to what? Five. X is 10, right? You see... They have, you're familiar with this whole issue of gematria. Here, here's something that's going to blow your mind. The, the, the six letters that the Romans use for their gematria, which is I, V, X, L, C, and D, you add all those numbers together, the values, you know what number it comes up to? 666. Wow. Can't make that one up, can you? 666. 600, here's another thing. I don't know what it means necessarily, but it's interesting. 666 is the sum of all the numbers between 1 and 36. So I add 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 4 plus 5 plus 6 plus 7 plus all the way to 36. I get exactly 66, 666. What does that mean? I don't know. All I know is, well, here's what I know. The word beast, the same word here used here, it's a special word, shows up exactly 36 times in the Bible, both Old and New Testament. It's crazy as that is. So what does that mean? I don't know. I'm just telling you. It's pretty weird. It's pretty spooky. One of the most spooky things, in my opinion, of this whole, the, the way you spell, the, way, the easiest way, there's multiple ways you can come up with the number 666 using gematria. Of course, we can add numbers different ways and have different possibilities. You can have longer names, shorter names, but the easiest way to spell the number 666 is just with three letters in the Greek language. Just six letters. I'm sorry, did I say six? That's three. Whatever my fingers say, not my, not my face. <laughs> Just three letters. So here's, here's the name of Christ in, in Greek. That's the way you spell it. I don't know if any of you have ever seen Greek. This is Christos. So K-R-I-S-T-O-S. That's Christos. The way that, it, that has, by the way, not, uh, do you know what the, you know what the, not the gematria of Christos, you know what the gematria of Jesus is? It's weird. It's 888. The name Jesus in the Greek, with the gematry equivalence of each of the letters, is exactly 888. Suppose that's a coincidence? I don't think so. What does it mean? I'm not too sure. 
but I, that's pretty weird, isn't it? Well, of course, this has a gematry. I'm not familiar with the Christos gematry. Of course, this is Jesus' title. The way you form the gematria for 666 is you pull out the middle five letters. You pull out K-R-I-S-T, and you leave the, the, the chi, and you leave the S. You pull them out, and you put in the middle the, the C, the X-I. I can't even say it. So, so I, I take the, the chi, the xi, and the s, and I pull the middle letters out of it. This, this, the gametria of these three letters is 666. It's the easiest way to do it. There's, like I said, there's multiple ways you can do it. But it's very interesting, though, because that, that middle letter, the xi, was the Greek way. It was also their symbol for a serpent. So isn't that weird? So I pull out the heart of who Christ is, if you will, and just for our purposes, and I put in the snake... And I get 666. Interesting. I find it very, very interesting. So, so wow, we're stopping right there. Let's pray and we'll be dismissed. Thank you, God, so much for your word that gives us light, gives us life, teaches us what we couldn't know otherwise. Lord, we trust that your word and your spirit are going to lead us into all truth. And we're asking you, God, for wisdom for the days we live in, to be the people that we're supposed to be, um, to represent you the way we're supposed to, to make disciples wherever we go. Thank you, Lord. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thanks for visiting. Find us at www.islandbaptistchurch.org.